some machines in the pavilion 6000 range where if you write to port OX80 too many times, the machine locks up. This turns out to be inconvenient. So, uh, arguably, Linux was always being stupid here because assuming that you've got no hardware on a port which is explicitly designed for a piece of plug-in hardware to be added is a foolish idea, and Linux is gradually being refactored such that this isn't a problem. For now, a bunch of workarounds being put in place to make sure that these HPs boot. But, uh, yeah. Don't try to run life support machines off HP laptops. If you take home one message today, that should probably be it. But don't run life support machines on laptops as well. So anyway, if we assume that Linux boots on your laptop and doesn't crash within five minutes or crash whenever you first try to read the time or crash because you've looked at it funny, then uh, your hardware works, right? How many people have bought laptops in the past year or so? How many of them had something other than Intel graphics? Right. Uh, did the graphics work first time? No. Yeah. Uh, sometimes it will, sometimes it won't. But hardware manufacturers, especially graphics manufacturers, for reasons which aren't entirely clear, hate us. It's an impressively sort of visceral hate. Rather than merely pretending that these don't exist, uh, they actually tend to go out and do things just to make us particularly unhappy, like release new chipsets, which are slightly different for no reason whatsoever. Okay, those of you who bought laptops in the past year or so, uh, some of you said that they didn't have Intel. Did anybody buy a gra uh, laptop that didn't have either Intel, AMD, or NVIDIA graphics? What's that have? Oh, yeah, sorry, ATI is bought by AMD now. So, um, did anybody else put their hands up? No. All right, okay, you're all sensible people. If you go into, I don't know what you call them over here, uh, like, I would say CompUSA, except they're dead, aren't they? Uh, Best Buy or something like that. And you look at the computers there and you know, they all have those stickers on telling you how fantastic this laptop is and how buying this laptop is going to revolutionize your life and all the members of the appropriate sex will believe that you are the best ever person because you've bought this laptop that's about this size, weighs three kilos, uh, that's 75 pounds or something, I don't know. <laughs> I really don't understand Imperial units. Uh, and has the performance of a dead sloth. But they all have those stickers, and occasionally they'll say things like, uh, contains Trident Cyberblade XP35 chipset, and that sounds really fast. That sounds great. That sounds like you're going to be playing Quake 3 on multiple sides of a spinning cube simultaneously. <laughs> and that's just the screensaver. Don't buy those laptops. The drivers, uh, most of the manufacturers don't care about Linux because Linux represents about 1% of their market and their market represents about five computers. Those of you who can count means that Linux doesn't run on these machines. But even if you ignore these machines with graphics from companies you've never heard of, uh, you don't necessarily end up with graphics that work. Uh, you may still have a computer that just fails to boot I'm really hoping that this dot, dot, dot means that the next slide continues. Oh, no, right, okay. I'll, I'll just make some stuff up. AMD have recently released uh, video specifications for us, which means that there are now drivers that basically work for 2D for most recent AMD ATI chipsets. Uh, on some of them, it's even accelerated, except not the latest ones yet. It turns out it's been quite difficult to write a good graphics driver. Not as difficult as Novell might want to make you believe, but that's a completely separate story. Other than that, uh, NVIDIA... NVIDIA really hates us. NVIDIA occasionally give us a code drop of a driver that is supposed to drive their latest chips in 2D mode, and it's full of magic constants that you can't read, and nobody understands what it's doing. 
and then it doesn't work, and then you file a bug, and then nothing happens for three months, and then uh, NVIDIA send you an email saying, resume in the subject line. You think, hurrah, they've finally got in touch with me because they're taking suspend resume functionality seriously. And it turns out that actually they just can't type resume. They're asking you for a job. <laughs> The fact that you're buying a machine with NVIDIA or AMD graphics doesn't necessarily mean it's going to work significantly better, unless you're willing to use closed drivers. But anyway, by some fluke of chance, you've uh, bought a computer, you've put in a boot CD, it's booted into graphics mode, this is the first time you're not running Debian. <laughs> I'm going to die for this. Uh, except your wireless still doesn't work, and your sound might not work, and your media card reader probably doesn't work, and your hard drive protection, well, obviously that doesn't work, and some of the buttons don't work, and... Sigh. I'm going to go over some of these and explain why they don't work. For the most part, the answer is because somebody hates you. Uh, which is a theme that I found that, in general, life is a lot easier where if, if I just assume that everything bad that happens to me is because somebody hates me. That way it's personal. That way I really want to rectify the situation. Find whoever it is that hates me and repeatedly smash their face through a window. And with luck, in future, they won't be so ridiculously awkward. Wireless doesn't tend to work because... Uh... There are multiple issues with wireless. Mostly that wireless companies think that their chipsets contain all sorts of valuable intellectual property and that's why they can sell them at $3 each. <laughs> or something like that. But we cannot, as a Linux community, get specifications for most wireless hardware. The majority of wireless cards sold nowadays do not have open specifications. That includes Intel stuff. Intel have the specifications but have not released them to the community, so we're dependent on Intel to provide drivers for wireless cards. Broadcom, uh, we have a reverse engineered driver that mostly works except when it doesn't, and on newer cards where it always doesn't except when it does. Atheros, you've got a mixed open closed driver that is gradually being re-implemented in the form of a reverse engineered entirely open driver, which again sometimes works, sometimes doesn't, and uh, well, who knows. Sort of Russian roulette for wireless cards. Except in the case of um, Atheros, well, Atheros provides this mixed driver, so arguably they're best than Broadcom, who don't provide driver at all. The problem with the Atheros one is that generally Atheros don't supply any functionality to support new chipsets until sometime between six months and the death of the universe after they release a new chipset. It's, I, on 32-bit Linux, if you get a patch out of the Mad Wi-Fi subversion tree, uh, sorry, out of the Mad Wi-Fi uh, bug tracker, you can make the latest Mad Wi-Fi cards work. Unfortunately, this breaks 64-bit support entirely. So uh, people with 64-bit laptops and these cards, uh, well, they lose horrifically. I would say sorry, except you're the ones who bought them. That was foolish. And then there's stuff from smaller manufacturers like Rarlink. Uh, Rarlink are kind of weird, and they provide documentation, and they, well, some amount of documentation, and they provide some number of reference drivers. The problem is that, for reasons that aren't entirely clear to me, these are not included in the kernel, and the versions that are in the kernel don't work, and you're supposed to get them off some site that's got Serial Monkey in the domain name. Um, yeah, there's an argument that anything with the word serial monkey in its name is not enterprise ready. <laughs> Sound. Uh, Intel wrote a lovely specification called HDA for high definition audio, and all recent laptops tend to implement this because nobody makes codec chips for anything else nowadays. The problem with HDA is that it's a specification that allows you to wire up any given audio codec in, uh, let me think, I think that's about 256 pins. What's 256? That's kind of big, isn't it? Yeah, you can wire these up in a lot of different ways. And in principle, the BIOS contains a table that tells you how they're wired up. 
How many of you have ever worked with BIOS engineers or firmware engineers? Yeah, uh, how was your experience of that? Right, okay. If you don't want to talk about it, I think that says it all. These tables are often wrong. As a result, you need to have a static pin mapping built into the kernel, and then it needs to look up your specific cards and then use that specific pin mapping. And this is difficult because uh, somebody needs to get the card, work out what the mapping is, then gets it into the kernel, then it needs to get out to the distributions, and six months later, you find that your sound works now except the right-hand speaker's turned into a microphone. <laughs> and your headphone socket just has this glowing red pulsing light behind it the entire time because it's accidentally been turned into a digital output rather than an analog one. Your media card reader doesn't work because, again, they won't tell us the specifications. SD cards now mostly work because it, a few years back, uh, the SD card consortium developed something called SDHCI, which is a specification for SD card readers. And any card reader that conforms to the SDHCI spec should work with the same driver. Obviously, this, again, is lies. Most of them do it all slightly differently, so the driver kind of works and then it stops working and you find that, oh, on this chip I do this in this order, on this chip I do this in this order. And if you try to do the same order on both chips, it all goes perfectly wrong, and you suddenly get massive file system corruption, and, well, running a file system off an SD card was probably an error. But hey, uh, you may manage to recover some of your pictures of the Serengeti, or wherever it was. Anything that isn't an SD reader probably doesn't work, except for some of the Texas Instrument-based ones where we've got memory stick reading working as well. Uh, that's memory sticks are Sony specifications. Sony tried to keep their specifications secret by cunningly releasing almost enough of the specification to be able to write a driver and then removing all the hex numbers associated with the fields. The assumption that people can't go 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7 down the table is uh, an interesting one, but people are able to work out enough of it from that to be able to write a working driver. So that's nice. Ah, uh, yeah. Or possibly the specification, in fact, does go to OX10 after OX9. Hard drive protection. Bizarrely, this one's actually our fault to an extent. But uh, the vendors don't provide us with any of these docs. People work out how to make them work. And now, uh, on a lot of machines, we have the ability to ask your hardware whether it's... Uh, tilted to one side or another, or whether it's plummeting off a cliff at high speed, or whether your plane is crashing. The problem is that we don't then do anything with that information, like, say, spin your hard drive down. That's great, we can write software now that will interface with this and then flash up a box saying, hey, you look like you're in a car crash. Would you like to save your work? How am I doing for time? Okay. Uh, some of your buttons don't work because uh, there's about... Ooh, yeah, there's many different ways in which people can hook buttons up, and only one of these involves the keyboard controller. Which is... It was a thought, the obvious way of doing things. These are keys on my keyboard. Maybe they should work like keys. Sometimes you get keys that are next to each other that behave differently. They'll, some of them will go through your keyboard controller. Some of them will go through a magic firmware interface. Some of them will go through some sort of ACPI interface. Some of them, uh, like, for reasons that aren't entirely clear to me, the help button on my laptop go through the Windows management interface, despite all the other keys being real keys. I wrote a little driver. It's uh, like 40 lines of code, and all it does is make that button work on this machine. Then I looked at this, and I felt kind of sad. Uh, yeah, mm. Some things work, some things don't. People with laptops, for some reason that I sort of understand, seem to like the ability to suspend their laptops and then resume them again. 
many of you does this not work for? How many of you does this work for? Excellent. I think there's just a majority for which this works, which is so much better than it has been at most previous talks I've given. Either you're buying the right laptops or... Uh, if your failure rate is below 5%, then it's not statistically significant, and I don't care. <laughs> Sorry, I should probably point it out that I'm a biologist by trade, so uh, we're kind of fuzzy about statistics. Right. The majority of resume failures on recent Linux distributions, uh, unless you're running anything other than Ubuntu. Actually, again, that's kind of unfair. But the majority of the resume issues are down to the graphics not being reinitialized because the HPI specification doesn't require the firmware to reinitialize the graphics. And the argument there is that your drivers should reinitialize them because that way the drivers know what mode you're in when you suspend it. That way they can reprogram straight into that mode, which means you don't need to have the firmware reprogram into, say, text mode and then jump from text mode into graphics mode because that's got unsightly screen flicker and we're all about the seamless resume. Apple get this right, and uh, you open it, and by the time the lids open, the screen's already come back, and it's making weird thunking noises, and the pulsy heartbeat thing has stopped beating, and you wonder slightly as if you've killed it. But I do apologize for, occasion, uh, for occasionally just wandering off on completely unrelated tangents. Programming graphics chips are kind of hard. They're complicated things. Modern graphics chips have almost the same level of complexity as modern processors, which is really quite lost complexity. To the extent that the next, some of the next generation graphics chips are in fact going to be basically CPUs, just with a DVI port stuck on the side. But this doesn't really help people because you still want your graphics to work after you've resumed. So what can we do about that? The ideal situation is for the kernel to be able to reprogram the same graphics modes you were in before. And this is, as of 2.6.25, implemented in the Intel drivers, if you've got an i9.15 or later. If you've got an i8.30 or an, an i8.30 or an i855, then you lose. Buy a better laptop. But this means that you suspend, you resume, and then the kernel makes your graphics work again. And this is much faster than the other ways we have of doing it, which are to uh, call the video BIOS the way the uh, system does when you first turn it on in the hope that that will program the graphics. Call the Visa mode setting functions in the hope that that will make the graphics work. Ask the graphics card to switch back into text mode in the hope that that will make the graphics cards work. Something involving chickens These all suck because they take time and occasionally they crash your machine instead. Uh, what's made this even harder is that NVIDIA actually, after first boot, disable the entry point to their video BIOS so you can't use it to reinitialize your graphics. Thanks, NVIDIA. We love you. No, the other one, hate. That's it. So, as I said, the Intel driver now works. Uh, programming. NVIDIA and AMD graphics chips is harder because they're some more complex pieces of equipment. Uh, especially now that we're seeing that the 2D core is mostly being replaced by functionality from the 3D core, then we need to start caring a lot more carefully about what we're doing on Resume. The documentation released by AMD should be basically adequate for somebody to write enough support for the kernel to make this work. And in fact, Dave Verley at Red Hat is working on one aspect of this in the kernel at the moment. So for people with more recent AMD graphics chipsets or ATI chipsets, there is hope for Suspend Resume starting to work on your laptops. NVIDIA people get to wait until we finish reverse engineering it. Uh, people with VIA, Trident, S3, uh, God, whatever the hell you guys have put in your laptops. Uh, this really just depends on how bored I am as to whether I ever get around to implementing any of that, or how bored other people are and whether they ever get around to implementing any of that. But the, as I said, the main reason that graphics, uh, that Resume doesn't work for people is now the graphics drivers. Um, that's a difficult problem for us to solve. Uh, it's one that's going to have to be solved for Linux to be actually a compelling laptop platform. 
if you're not willing to buy from particular vendors. It's very, very difficult to mess up so badly in an operating system that the battery doesn't work. And I don't think we've ever really had this problem. Uh, so the battery works. There's only the minor problem that we consume way too much power and your battery runs out much earlier than it should do. Screens take much more power than they do in Windows. I was actually talking to Keith Packard of Intel about this uh, last week. And we realized that one thing that Windows does that Linux doesn't is that when the screen's not updating, if you've got a, a TFT in your laptop, TFTs don't really care too much about the refresh rate. So what you can do is, uh, if there's nothing being updated on the screen, you can reduce the rate at which you update the screen. And when you do that, say you halve the vertical refresh rate. Halving the vertical refresh rate means that you halve the clock rate of the LVDS link between the graphics chipset and the screen. You also halve the amount of memory you have to read in order to throw it onto the screen. And these may seem, sound like completely inconsequential things, but doing that can save about three quarters of a watt on a laptop. Uh, so if your laptop is this big, then three quarters of a watt is probably not particularly important. If your laptop's this big, three quarters of a watt is probably an extra half an hour of battery life. And there are certain other things that just aren't being done at the moment that we can do that will improve that. Wireless takes way too much power. Uh, I think this bugs in the process of being fixed, but at the moment, if you've got an Intel wireless chipset, if you take the interface down, or if you flick the hardware disable switch, the chip will still be powered up and will still be consuming power. It just won't be transmitting anything. Uh, it'll take up basically the same amount of power as it did if you were running, if you were broadcasting. Uh, so there's no power benefit in disabling it at the moment. What should be happening is that when you disable your network, either by network manager or if configuring the interface down or by hitting a hardware kill switch, the interface should be powered down and you should save battery. We suck. Serial ATA takes too much power. Uh, again, this is a combination. This is actually a combination of a couple of things. The first is that up until very lately, and I, a patch has been written for this, but I don't think it's upstream yet. Uh, on AHCI controllers, the FIs for the serial ATA links would be powered up even if there wasn't a serial ATA device connected to them, which wasn't particularly beneficial. And that's about, again, a quarter, three quarters for what if you fix it. Many machines have the BIOS program them into a legacy mode where the serial ATA controller behaves very like a, an ID controller from uh, 1988 or so. This is because XP is very stupid. But if you use this mode, you lose performance and you lose and you waste power. And one thing I'm looking into is the ability to have Linux on the fly reprogram these into the more advanced mode, but there may be a couple of gotchas that make this difficult. Ethernet, uh, yeah, it turns out that having your Ethernet chipset powered up when there's no cable plugged in is kind of a waste. Again, that's some amount of power that's just draining out of your battery in order to make your lap slightly warmer. So. By improving all of these things, he, almost, in almost all these cases, all this power is just being turned into heat. And in doing so, we are reducing your battery life, making the planets warmer, and decreasing your sperm count if you're male. So those of you who are relying on Linux power management being poor as a method of contraception <laughs> should probably be made aware that in the future this is going to stop working. <laughs> and we're going to be no more effective than Windows in that respect. Those of you who are just using the fact that you're running Linux at all as a method of contraception, uh, <laughs> we can do less about. Processors though, we do really well on processors. Linux consumes less power. Uh, under Linux, your CPU will consume less power than under any other operating system, even though you'll get the same as performance. Uh, part of that's because Intel have been very aggressive at writing codes that improves the support. And hey, Intel make processors. 
Intel also make graphics adapters, wireless, serial ATA controls, and Ethernet controllers, and they're getting to those. So, people occasionally ask me what kinds of laptop they should buy. Don't buy a laptop with anything made by NVIDIA. Right now, don't buy anything with an ATI or AMD graphics chipset. In the future, uh, to AMD's credit, they have released programming specifications for their chipsets. And within a reasonably short space of time, I think I'd be sufficiently happy with this, that with the quality of the drivers, that uh, I would remove that recommendation. But right now, if you want your graphics to work well and you want to use open source drivers, then going for an AMD or an ATI chipset is not a good plan as yet. No Broadcom wireless, no Atheros wireless. VIA, uh, they have actually announced this week that they are releasing programming specifications for most of their hardware. At the moment, the website which they said will contain this contains instead a picture of a uh, construction sign across the street with under construction underneath. What surprised me is that they don't have a little man with a pickaxe animated. I think they're missing a trick there. For the most part, expensive laptops work best than cheap ones. And the reason for this is actually slightly surprising. When you buy expensive laptops, that normally means that they're coming from the business range rather than uh, the consumer range of a manufacturer. Laptops within the same range of business machines tend to have what's called uh, a single preload. And this is to make it easier for IT workers in the companies that buy large numbers of these. The idea there is that the same install image will work on all these machines. So that means that most of the hardware is the same between all of them. At the consumer range, though, two machines that look like they come from the same range may, in fact, be made by different third-party vendors in different countries and then just put in the same box. And one number changed on the, spe on the uh, specification. The enhanced commonality means that the hardware tends to be slightly more conservative. It tends to be from a smaller range of potential hardware. And uh, often this hardware tends to be the stuff which is being bought by people who want to run Linux on laptops, companies who want to run Linux on laptops, companies who are willing to go to their vendors and say, we're happy to buy some thousands of laptops off you, but only if they run Linux. Tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands, whatever. So we tend to get better support for that hardware. There is one corollary to this. How many of you run Linux on Apples? Why? What are you doing? What is the point? The hardware is more expensive. The hardware is not really any better. And the vendor has explicitly designed these machines to run an operating system that isn't Linux. Don't do it. You're being stupid. Thank you. So, uh, yeah, uh, it is possible to get Apple hardware running Linux reasonably well, but it's an uphill battle both ways, and it's raining. And there's snow. Sleep, snow, whatever. Uh, the rain is falling, and it's immediately freezing when it hits the ground, and you're sliding back downhill. Because Apple have just released a new bootcamp firmware upgrade that actually changes the location of the video ROM, and suddenly nothing works anymore. Just to make things easier for you, I have this little flowchart. <laughs> I'm going to just walk through this to make sure everybody understands. <laughs> Is everything in the laptop made by Intel? If not, you failed. <laughs> Try again. If everything is made by Intel, you may have success. And I should be entirely open and fair here, and uh, Intel gave me this laptop. So, but it's a very nice laptop, and I would wholeheartedly recommend it to you. It's made by HP rather than Intel. It's just everything in it's made by Intel. So I guess Intel makes some ridiculous amounts of money off it. Uh, right, those of you who are not blind have probably noticed that there's a small asterisk next to success.
the fact that Intel have made everything in your laptop does not necessarily mean it will work. Writing drivers is quite difficult. Uh, the size of the team's writing drivers in the Linux world is not necessarily anywhere near the number of people in the Windows world devoted to it. It's also probably less in the way of long-term support contracts. That means that if you have old hardware, then bugs in that driver are not necessarily ever going to be fixed. And we still have the problem that certainly for the Intel wireless hardware, we don't have the specifications. The only people who can fix any of it are Intel. We do now have the specifications for the graphics chipset, so uh, that's something where all of those of you who are actually expert graphics chipset programmers, but just never did anything about it because you didn't have any documentation, you can go and fix Intel bugs now. I'm sure there's at least zero of you here. But, uh, yeah, having a machine that in principle is well supported by Linux does not mean that the hardware is actually well supported by Linux. And there's no hard and fast rule to work out whether or not that's the case for a given computer that you're looking at buying. All I can really recommend is, uh, where possible, buy your laptop from, from a vendor who will accept it back if it doesn't work on, if Linux doesn't work on it. Or alternatively, ask people who have a laptop you're thinking of buying how well Linux works on it. Okay, I should probably point out that since I'm in America and there's the potential for litigation, I do not endorse going on crazy mad killing sprees. Yeah. Uh, oh, also, uh, don't think, oh, I'm not going to choose any of these options, I'll just use meth instead. That's also hazardous to your health. <laughs> Do I really say anything here? <laughs> uh, who do we blame? Uh, that was the question I asked at the beginning of this talk. The answer is that uh, we blame the hardware vendors and we blame the people that write Linux. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. So uh, we've got uh, 15 minutes or so for questions. Anybody have any questions? Um, I have a relatively new laptop here. I bought this thing this year. It's a, it's a Lenovo. And uh, it feels dead cool. But that's because I've been tweaking around with PowerTop for a while and trying to rebuild the kernel, all the usual Linux nerd stuff. And um, it keeps saying top causes for wake-ups, uh, kernel IPI rescheduling interrupts. Why does Linux reschedule interrupts so much? And why is it waking the machine up all the time? What's actually happening there is that that's being caused by processes moving between the two cores of your processor. Uh, but in order for the scheduler to do this migration, it needs to have an interrupt schedule to cause it to do this movement. This is arguably Linux being dumb. And there is work being done in more recent kernels to improve uh, to try to leave processes on the processor, on the same core, much more, and not bounce stuff between them. You can get rid of those by booting a non-SMP kernel. Uh, if you never enable the other core, then it will not power up and should consume basically no power. The other thing you can do is use processor hot plug, the processor hot plug interface to hot unplug one of your cores. However, in that case, the core will not be powered down entirely, so you won't get the same power benefits. As it's really, this is just something where uh, the kernel is going to have to improve. But some number of those are pretty much inevitable consequences of running on a dual core machine. Well, uh, last time I tried uh, removing the double core uh, support, the temperature went through the roof. So. Sorry, uh, removing the support uh, for... In the BIOS, uh -huh. I changed uh, from two processor, well, two core, to... It's possible that the uh, BIOS was doing it wrong, which would leave both cores powered up, but would mean that Linux never did anything to uh, stop the other one consuming power. Okay. 
so then it wouldn't be scaled, and so you'd potentially burn through more power. Okay. Can you fix my laptop? <laughs> my rates are very reasonable. We can discuss that afterwards. I've, um, I've read you post in uh, bug reports on why it's so difficult to have like a boot splash and still support some of the suspend and hibernation features. Can you talk about that a little bit? Okay, um, there, the question there is more about uh, what limitations are there in providing a graphical boot splash and still letting suspend resume work? Most, with the exception of Fedora's boot splash, which uses X, most traditional boot splash implementations for Linux have used, sorry, use the frame buffer device. And the only frame buffer driver that works on the majority of Linux hardware is something called Visa FB, which uses the old Visa mo programming interface that it was provided since the early 90s in most PC graphics cards. And that works, that's fine. The problem with this is, as I said, when we resume the computer, in most cases we need to resume the graphics. The problem with Visa FB is that usually the best we can resume is uh, to text mode. And then we resume, the kernel starts up, and then it tries to write something to the frame buffer. Except now, since we haven't been able to reprogram the visa mode correctly, the first time the kernel tries to access the frame buffer, it's writing into memory that may no longer have the graphics card behind it. And this can cause the machine to lock up. So visa FB can just be impossible to work with in a suspend resume environment. There's no way to make it work properly. Uh, what we did in Ubuntu was do all the visa mode setting from user space, which means that we're not stuck with visa FB. We can then switch back to text mode before suspend and resume. And that's a lot safer, because then the kernel won't try to do things without us being able to stop it. Uh, but that's why SUSE arguably has worse suspend and resume support. Any more questions? Yeah, down here. probably still bugs in some of our drivers, and input-related stuff is surprisingly difficult to get right for a hardware design that's existed for over 20 years. Do you think this wouldn't be a problem as it is? Uh, right, you're right. There's a few machines which seem to have that kind of bug, and I don't... I can point you to the uh, 2,000 lines of code where the bug probably is, but I appreciate that that probably doesn't help much. But, yeah. There are some bugs other than the graphics resume. We still have things that need fixing within Linux that will impact negatively upon suspend resume. But at this point, I think the single biggest issue is the graphics. And fixing that would get most people's machines working. Anyone else? No? Well, thanks very much.